Good evening, everybody. Welcome. And thank you for having the department back here tonight. Um, before we get started, um, I'd like to first introduce myself. My name is Sean Moriarty, Tom's River North, class of 1998. Before that, Intermediate West, when it was still known as Intermediate West, and before that, Westover Elementary School. In 1984, my family moved into a small rented house at 21 Disney Drive in a neighborhood off of 37 on the border of the Sibagaiki property. We played football on that property growing up. We hopped the eight-foot chain-link fence and walked from our neighborhood to Walmart in the summertime and wondered why our parents were so upset when we did that. It seemed like simple trespassing. Obviously, there was more concern there for them in 1988 to 1994. My mother, a long-time onco long oncology nurse, worked seven to seven shifts for years at Community Medical Center, joined by my grandmother and my sister on staff. My father, an entrepreneur and small business owner, worked out of a downtown office next to the River Lady until he passed from kidney cancer almost 15 years ago. Today, my other sister, Kate, is in the audience today, is the Moriarty in the Kelleher, Van Dyke, and Moriarty Law Firm on Hooper Avenue in Tom's River. Now, I tell you this, not so you'll agree with me or agree with the department on the settlement. I say this only in the hope that you'll believe that I wouldn't stand here tonight in front of a place that I still say that I'm from if I didn't personally believe in the settlement that the department is proposing to achieve restoration for natural resource injuries at the Sipagaki site. If I didn't believe that the permanent preservation of 1,000 acres of developable land at the site of a groundwater injury with nine integrated restoration projects to address additional ecological injuries that will turn a long-standing environmental liability into an environmental asset squarely meets our constitutional duty to protect and restore the state's natural resources and is ultimately a good deal for the people of Tom's River. Now, while our focus is on the restorative value of this property and the value of those projects, we do believe it's worth noting the financial aspects of the proposed settlement. An analysis of comparable sales reveals that the, that the development value of the property is in excess of $200 million. And the cost of implementing, I see you laughing, I understand. The cost of implementing the restoration projects is around $30 million. With that said, we're not here tonight to advocate for our position. We're here tonight to provide you with, with transparency and empathy the information and perspective necessary to allow you to draw your own conclusions. In doing that, you're going to hear from people who care deeply about these issues and who have chosen to dedicate their careers to protecting the people of New Jersey. First, to address the concerns we've heard regarding the scope of the proposed settlement and the prior efforts at environmental accountability for this property, you'll hear from Mike Gordon, someone who spent decades working on behalf of communities, including representing the people of Tom's River in their fight against Sibagaiki. Mike will explain where this settlement, which comes at the tail end of decades of efforts, fits alongside a 40-year, $300 million remedial effort and prior state individual, individual claims, resulting in millions of dollars in penalties and compensation for individual damages. From there, David Hames and Anthony Fontana, who work each day to keep people safe from harmful exposures, will walk through our review of both the EPA-led Superfund cleanup and the DEP-led landfill closure and our efforts to ensure that the proposed preservation areas are safe for the proposed recreational use. Finally, Paul Stofa and David Bean, two individuals, individuals who live and breathe natural resource restoration, will more deeply discuss the basis and scope of natural resource matters, some of the practical considerations that the department must take into account in its efforts to return maximum value to the people of New Jersey for resource injuries, and explain the details of the proposed settlement, including the basis of our injury calculations. We're aiming to do all that in about a half hour to ensure that we have time to hear from you. So if our efforts at brevity have left your questions unanswered, we ask you to please come and answer, ask them for, of us. And we will do everything we can to answer those openly. Before we move forward, I just want to take one more minute to center us on, this, on the proposed settlement. The goal of natural re resource restoration is to ultimately provide equivalent compensation for injuries to natural resources like groundwater, surface water, and habitat, and considers the, the extent and duration of the injury. Now, this assessment necessarily comes 
at the tail end of the remediation process when, information, when the necessary information has been developed. In analyzing that information, we're required to draw, at times, difficult distinctions between what we think we know and what we can prove, with the latter serving as the basis of our decisions. Where that distinction is relevant here is as we consider groundwater injuries, which are more, we are more, able, more easily able to quantify, and ecological impacts, like discharges to the Toms River and the Atlantic, Atlantic Ocean, which we know occurred, but we lack the same type of information necessary to fully quantify those injuries. That's why I consider it helpful to think of this settlement in two parts. First, to address the groundwater injuries, we're proposing the on-site preservation of 1,000 acres, or approximately 80% of the 1,200 acres that our models show would, would lead to the, to the um, full compensation for those injuries. The second aspect, the nine integrated on-site ecological restoration uplift projects with public access largely provided in previously undeveloped areas Sorry, lost my spot. Those, those projects are intended to provide additional compensation for the ecological injuries we are less able to quantify. So take the, taking those numbers together, along with the estimated $300 million in remedial costs, the total costs of this, of this project, while an imperfect measure of sufficiency, are around a half a billion dollars for the site. Lastly, we empathize with those that feel the proposed settlement is not enough that it's incomplete because it can't address the personal injury and losses that some folks have suffered. But we do want to ensure that folks understand that this settlement in no way affects those remedial obligations. BASF remains, remains responsible for full remediation of the site, and nothing about this settlement affects anyone's ability to bring an individual claim for any harm that they've suffered. So with that, I'd like to hand the mic off to hand the mic off to Mike, and we'll begin our presentation. And I look forward to speaking with all of you when we're finished. Thank you so much. Good evening. Thank you for coming out. As Sean said, my name is Michael Gordon. I'm currently in the position of Senior Policy Advisor at the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. I rejoined the department in 2017 after spending 35 years as a private practicing plaintiff's environmental lawyer representing communities like Toms River. In fact, I represented over 500 individuals in Toms River in a lawsuit against Siba Geige in the year 2000. As part of that lawsuit it required me to spend years litigating against that company, understanding their waste disposal practices, recognizing the severe impacts they had on the community, and in fact, growing out of that litigation, representing the 500 individuals, we filed a class action that resulted in any resident of Toms River in the years 1965 and 66 being eligible for medical monitoring because Siba Geige had polluted the town's drinking water with benzidine-based dyes. As part of that effort, I had to be aware of the prior environmental regulatory actions that began in the late 1970s when the Department of Environmental Protection became concerned after site inspections with the nature of the operations at the Siba Geige site. That led to restrictions on the types of waste that were able to be disposed of on site. That restriction was violated by Siba Geige in the state of New Jersey in the 1980s, indicted the Siba Geige Corporation and individuals for illegal hazardous waste disposal. That criminal and uh, indictment was resolved in 1992 when the company paid a $9 million fine that would be worth about $25 million now for their illegal disposal of hazardous waste and they agreed to begin to spend a minimum of $50 million to remediate the site at that time. 1983, the Environmental Protection Agency placed the site on the Superfund list 
Since that time in 1983, the company has spent over $300 million in investigating and remediating the site in order to bring it into compliance with our remediation standards. You'll hear about the difference between remediation and natural resource damages as the night progresses. This community has suffered. I've spent years working on behalf of individuals who suffered personal injury, of families who've lost loved ones. Those, some of you may have participated in those cases. Others may have heard of those cases. But what we're talking about tonight is the natural resource damage piece of society's effort to hold Siba Geige and now BASF responsible for beginning to be fully held accountable under the law. The pieces that have occurred include, most of you have probably heard of the childhood cancer cluster cases. What could be more devastating than a series of childhood cancers where families lose young ones? That occurred in this community. We understand your pain. We tried to recognize that as we sat down with BASF. I was a member of the negotiating team with BASF. And as Sean laid out, if we didn't believe, based on what is the appropriate scope of natural resource damage claims and the history of the remediation piece, the personal injury cases that have been brought successfully by members of the Toms River community, and now the natural resource damage component that you'll hear tonight, that we were putting together an appropriate response we would not have proposed the settlement for your comment. We're here to receive your questions, try and provide some answers. Hopefully, you will see that for where this action, where this proposed settlement fits in, it's an appropriate, fair proposal made by BASF, who is not the same company that did the illegal hazardous waste dumping and that had that devastating impact on the community, even though they are legally liable for that conduct. We believe that we're going to be able to outline for you tonight why this proposal makes sense, but we are happy to hear your comments and try and answer any of your questions. Thank you. We'll now hear from Assistant Commissioner David Hames. Good evening, everybody. My name is David Hames. I'm the Assistant Commissioner of Contaminated Site Remediation and Redevelopment at the DEP. I've been with the DEP for over 33 years. I've always been in the remediation program. I've worked on soil remediations and groundwater remediations and other cases not quite as similar to Siva Geigy. So, as Mike had said, the site was initially listed on the National Priorities List in 1983. That's an EPA distinction, and that allowed the site to be considered a Superfund site. Uh, EPA is the federal version of the DEP, and EPA is the actual remediation lead for this site. Uh, the DEP works in concurrence and in support of EPA. Uh, EPA comes up with the plans, or BASF comes up with the plans. They go through EPA, they seek EPA approval and DEP will also look at those, and we will concur with, the, uh, with EPA, provided everything meets our, our requirements as well. Uh, EPA divides their Superfund sites into phases. Each phase is considered an operable unit, uh, so that's just a term of art that they use. There are two operable units at Sibagaygi. There's the groundwater, is operable unit one. Uh, you may hear me say OU1, as indicated on the slide there and the source areas on the main plant were considered uh, operable, operable unit two, OU2. Next slide. So what's happened for the Superfund remediation? Uh, they've installed a groundwater pump and treat system. Uh, I'm sorry, 
first part. Uh, as Mike had said, we're going to distinguish between remediation goals and uh, natural resource damage goals. Remediation goals are based on health-based standards and ecological health-based standards, human health-based and ecological-based standards. Uh, that they may be done, a, any remediation may be completed in terms of meeting our health-based and eco-based standards, but they will still be required to continue on with their natural resource restoration efforts. Uh, those numbers tend to be lower. Uh, the groundwater remediation includes pumping the contaminated groundwater, treating it to applicable water quality standards, and then discharging back to the ground. Currently, the entirety of this groundwater recharge is occurring in the northeast area of the property. Uh, if you have the handouts, I believe it shows where the restoration area number seven will be located, and that is where the current recharge is occurring. Uh, the groundwater is monitored quarterly, and pumping is adjusted as needed. If they see uh, wells constantly coming back as having every, all the contaminants below standard, they may no longer pump from that area. If they see an uptick in an area, they can easily move their system around and start pumping from this new area instead, or this different area. Uh, for the soil remediation, 47,000 drums were removed and disposed off-site. 341,000 cubic yards of soil and debris were excavated and close to 300,000 cubic yards of additional soils were treated on site and backfilled on site. So that's, that's a very extensive remediation for, for the sites that I've worked on. Uh, additional remediation, remedial actions have been completed. 28 acres of caps have been installed, uh, whether that's clean material or putting down concrete or asphalt. Uh, 1.3 miles of slurry walls have been installed, and that's usually like a clay material they put in under the ground and we use the word key they key that into a unit deeper in the ground that slurry wall is of uh, made of, of material so that the groundwater cannot get through it or if it does it takes thousands of years hundreds of years thousands of years so basically they've created a bathtub that keeps the contaminated groundwater in it's preventing additional migration of contamination off the property and the Tom's River is monitored semi-annually, and the results are showing that there are no longer any impacts from groundwater into the river. Thank you. So sampling that occurred last summer, or last year, last spring and summer, uh, based on conversations with BASF and members of my staff, they came up with this grid pattern that sampled both across the site in both the restoration areas as well as the production area. Uh, I'll be honest, I keep forgetting the number. It's about 50 samples at least, if not more. Uh, maybe closer to 80 samples were collected. And for, uh, they were specifically taken from the top two feet of the soil. And we were looking to make sure whether there would be any impacts at that surface area for that intended use of recreational use, people coming through however many days a week, however many hours a day, just walking through the park, whether on their own, taking their dog for a walk, anything like that. And all of the results were uh, analyzed and compared to our standards, the state standards, and all results were below the residential remediation standards. So in terms of a direct contact, those are our most conservative numbers, and there were no exceedances of those numbers. Uh, those residential standards, as opposed to a recreational person walking through, are based on an exposure of 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for 26 years. So again, these, nothing was found that exceeded any, any of those standards. Lastly, so future monitoring and maintenance activities to be performed. As Sean had pointed out, BASF is not done with the remediation. They are still out there uh, working on the pump and treat system. If they come across any additional contamination while working on any of these res restoration areas, they are required to take care of that, clean it up to the standards. Uh, Again, that they're manipulating the pump and treat system. Depending on what they find, they can move things around. They can pump from different areas. They're not walking away from any of this. Uh, and lastly, uh, recently, PFAS, if people have read about PFAS in the news, the per and polyfluoral alkyl substances, please do not make me say that a second time. Uh, we are making them look on site for that. We are doing that to all of our sites across the state, whether they're our Superfund site, uh, just a regular spill fund site, 
Uh, there's another group of cases, the Industrial Site Recovery Act. Any case that's coming through, we are making them either investigate whether PFAS are a potential or actually taking samples. BASF has committed to actually looking and seeing if they have PFAS in the soil, and I believe they will also be investigating whether they see any of it in the groundwater. So again, you know, the takeaway, the sampling that was done shows that the soils in the surficial area are good for the intended use of, of recreational use, and irrespective, BASF is not walking away. They're going to be out there continuing with this remediation until it's determined that everything is done. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Next up is Anthony Fontana, who's going to discuss the details of the landfill closure. Thank you for coming out. Uh, my name is Anthony Fontana, and I'm the Bureau Chief of the Bureau of Solid Waste Permitting. I've been working at DEP for the past 37 years working on permitting waste management facilities, starting for a number of years with hazardous waste facilities and moving over to solid waste and recycling centers. So I've been involved with permitting incinerators, landfills, and transfer stations for quite some time. Um, I'm an Ocean County resident, and um, and for a little bit of color, um, one of my co-op jobs I had at school was up at Niagara Falls, and I got to live right by Love Canal. Um, so I was right off the fenced area and got to talk to some people that were evacuated from that area. It was quite an eye-opening experience. Um, well, back to our site here. There was one activity Seba Geigy performed that required a permit from our group, and that was for the landfill. We permitted the landfill, um, started in 1977. We permit it for four cells. So it's one landfill, but four distinct areas. Um, so we permit the four cells. Area f cell four was never constructed, so we have to worry about that. They operated cell one until um, 1982, and then 1982 to 1984, they operated cell two. They were found to, uh, th the permit allowed them to dispose of wastewater treatment plant sludge and dry chemical non-hazardous waste. They were found to have violated that permit in cell two, and they had disposed of drummed liquid waste. Um, um, so they were ordered to remove that drummed waste from the landfill. There was approximately 15,000 drums that had to be removed and shipped off site. Later, they were ordered to remove the remaining sludge and liner system from that and dispose of that waste into cell three, which operated from 1988 and closed in 2006. So what we have there today is cell one and cell three. Both those cells are double-lined cells, and what that means is um, they collect leachate. Leachate is the liquids that percolate down through the waste material, very contaminated liquid generally. And at the bottom of both cells in one and three, there's a liner system, and if I can make an analogy, if people are familiar with a pool liner, um, that plastic thing. So at the bottom of the, the landfill cells, there's a liner. The landfills are sloped to a sump to collect the leachate, and the leachate gets pumped out and over to the wastewood treatment system. Below the first liner is a second liner, a leak detection system, basically, if it were to leak from the first liner. So they have the second liner that also does the same thing. Both cells one and three both have the double liner system. On top of that, we monitor groundwater in the area. There's an upgradient well and a few different downgradient wells. And we, they monitor them semi-annually. And there's some to look to see if there's any leachate that seems to be entering the groundwater. And we have no indication that cells one and three are leaking. So at this point, it looks like the liner systems are holding up and do, performing as function, as they're supposed to function. Um, we are now into the post-closure phase. After a landfill en enters operating phase and closes, they enter a 30-year, by regulatory definition, 30-year post-closure phase. Now that 30 years can be extended, more shortened, but it can be extended if, if warranted. And during the post-closure phase, they have to make sure the integrity of the cap on top of these landfill cells is maintained. They have to continue to collect the leachate, take groundwater samples, and just basically maintain the landfill. 
and we've been monitoring that, and they have been fulfilling, BASF has been fulfilling their post-closure obligations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anthony. Up next is our Chief Advisor, Paul Stofa, who's going to walk through some of the considerations um, in setter, settling natural resource damages liability, and then David Bean will discuss the specifics of the settlement. Thank you, Deputy Commissioner, and thank you, Tom Driver, for inviting us back. My name is Paul Stofa, and I serve as Chief Advisor at the NJDEP. I'm a lifelong New Jersey resident, and I um, have been practicing environmental law for approximately 20 years, first at the Attorney General's office, and then since November 2021, in-house at DEP. And um, I was part of the first uh, team at the AG's office that brought the first NRD trials ever in New Jersey to trial. Um, we started filing a lot of matters in 2004 and 2007, and a couple of our cases went to trial in 2010. I'm going to briefly mention those a little bit later. Um, but I've also worked on several natural resource restoration settlements during my time, and they've resulted in monetary recoveries and ecological projects. Um, some of our ecological projects have been removal of obsolete dams, wetlands creation and enhancement, and land preservation, particularly for groundwater settlements. What I'm going to talk about today is what is NRD, what is natural resource restoration, and NRD, as I like to say, is a little bit of law and science and economics. And, and how do you value these natural resources that have been injured over time? It is challenging. And I'm gonna talk about some of the factors and considerations that we at the department grapple with when reaching potential settlements. NRD claims, natural resource damage legal claims, are claims of a trustee to recover primary restoration and compensatory restoration damages. In New Jersey, the DEP is the trustee of all natural resources in the state. These claims actually have their root in the Roman jurisprudence, going back to Emperor Justinian, um, which said that the public had a right to use common natural resources like air, wildlife, the shorelines, and clean rivers and streams. In more recent history here in the Garden State, the public trust is alive and well. It's been codified in strong environmental statutes like the Spill Act, or a Spill Compensation and Control Act, what we call the Spill Act for short. The Spill Act defines natural resources. Um, natural resources are all land, fish, shellfish, wildlife, biota, air, waters, including groundwater, and other such resources owned, managed, held in trust, or other, otherwise controlled by the state. In New Jersey, any adverse change regardless of standard, often contam chemical contamination constitutes a natural resource injury under our law. New Jersey law also recognizes and encourages two avenues for the state to pursue natural resource restoration, litigation and voluntary or cooperative settlements. And so when you have a measurable injury, you then calculate the damages that are resulting because of that injury. And Dave Bean will talk about that in a few minutes. Now, um, damages then take the form of various forms. I mentioned them earlier. Um, land preservation is very important for our groundwater settlements because it's preserving land in perpetuity, and that's protecting the groundwater resource. What's challenging in NRD sometimes is that we often think of dollars and cents, but in natural resource restoration, you're talking natural resources and natural resources. You want to offset one-to-one -one is the goal. You want an equivalent amount of a natural resource to reimburse you for the amount of natural resource that's been injured. There's a lot of challenges in these cases. There's old data, unavailable data, witnesses who are no longer available, complex technical issues like uh, a nexus between whether someone's discharged caused contamination over there. And so all these competing factors weigh into whether we pursue litigation or pursue settlement. All right, so you're doing that? Yep. 
start. Okay. So ultimately, the courts have recognized that whether a settlement will be upheld is whether it's fair, reasonable, and in the public interest. In other words, does this outcome provide a, a fair result to compensate the public for the impacts to natural resources? We have to analyze the offer at the time it's made and consider under the totality of the circumstances, is it a fair result? Our experience over the last 25 years has shown if you go the litigation route, it's 10 plus years in complex cases. We have some cases that were filed in 2007 that have still not fully resolved to this day. The litigation approach also utilizes the use of special outside counsel, experts from across the country who bring these claims on behalf of us, but they cost money too. Their retention agreements um, to, re, you know, to pay them appropriately for the hard work they do, do eat into the ultimate recovery that a public, but the public would instead receive 100% um, through a voluntary settlement. We've also been aware that circumstances where you have a successor corporation, um, courts have been reluctant under, um, you know, uh, to hold those successor corporations as liable for uh, punitive damages of a corporate predecessor many decades ago. So that intentional illegal conduct that one company may have done many decades ago may not translate well to courts in the present day. We consider all these factors in weighing whether a natural resource restoration settlement is fair. In the SEBA context, we've also heard complaints about um, it's not punishing the uh, polluter enough. And natural resource damages are not punitive in nature. They're not penalties. Um, they're not uh, a criminal indictment, as Mr. Gordon talked about earlier. Um, and so what we do is we looked at whether the source of the, uh, under the Constitution, we have an obligation to look at whether the result that we're getting is close to the site of the injury. Since 2017, there was a constitutional amendment passed at that time that said natural resource money recoveries have to be put back into the environment, they can't go to the general state budget, and they have to be performed as close to the injury as possible. Under that mandate that we have at the department as trustee, this settlement is first priority under the Constitution. It's as close to the injury as you can get. We also looked at things like, what will these projects cost BASF ultimately? We believe that they could cost upwards of $30 million to build a wetland under what's currently a retention basin for stormwater. These are large engineering and construction projects, projects excuse me, that will take some time, money, design, permitting, all those things they have to do under the law to perform. And that's substantial cost to BASF. They will also be foregoing the right to ever sell that 1,000 acres. We looked at the Bretton Woods settlement, as has been recently reported in the, in the news. That's a mere 6.8 miles from this site for $8.55 million, 31.8 acres, acres were sold. If you take that per acre value, nearly $270,000, and just apply it to the 710 acres that are outside of the solar array, that's $190 million that BASF will never be able to get through selling the property. While that doesn't directly come into our NRD calculations, and whether we've, we've reached one and one, those other considerations here informed us at the department that this was a settlement fair, reasonable, and in the public interest. I hope this helped explain a little bit more about the NRD process and the considerations that we face at the department. I ask you now to give your attention to my colleague Dave Bean, who will describe in more detail the approach in reaching this proposed settlement with BASF. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. 
last but not least, the star of our show, Mr. David Bean. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, just a little bit of, of my background. I've been at DEP since 1989, and I've been in a variety of different programs, including the site remediation program, the wetlands program, flood hazard risk reduction, but I really found my passion in the Office of Natural Resource Restoration, where we have an opportunity to pursue responsible parties and restore natural resources for the use and benefit of the citizens. This is a schematic of the steps involved in taking a case from a hazardous discharge or spill event and getting it through to uh, a completed settlement. I really want to focus on this slide. I just want to focus on the first couple of steps. Um, when there is a spill event or release of hazardous substances into the environment, natural resources are injured. This is an opportunity for our office to engage in that situation and determine what resources have been injured, for how long, and to what degree. Once we, that forms the basis of our natural resource injury assessment. Once we have that injury properly assessed, we can then do the other part of the equation, which is determine how much resource we need to restore to offset those injured natural resources. And again, it's been said already before I got up here, we're looking at how much resource to restore. We are not looking at dollars. That's what our models calculate, and I'll talk more about that in another minute. <clears throat> so let's talk about the site. Here at Siva Geigy, they started operations in 1952. They ceased operations in, in 1996. It became a Superfund site in 1983. We know from the site history that they had an improper disposal of hazardous substances. They had processes that fouled the waterways in the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, we, we took all that into consideration. In 1983, when it became a Superfund site, that's really at the point at which analytical data was, was gathered, which is what we need to run our injury assessment models. It's difficult to run an injury assessment model without data. So we needed that to unfold. And, and I'm happy to say we've got a good, we've got a robust data set for groundwater. Um, <clears throat> so we, we know about the plume size. We know about the duration of the plume size. We also know that there's discharges to Tom's River and the Atlantic Ocean and terrestrial habitats. That is di more difficult to quantify than the groundwater in this case. So we had to look at the industrial history and we had to look at documents like the public health assessment to help us determine the appropriate amount of restoration. So the models, the models that we use to perform our injury assessment and restoration calculations, there are two that we focus on for this case. Uh, the ecological model is the habitat equivalency analysis, and for groundwater, we use what's called a resource equivalency analysis. And you'll notice similarities in both of those models. The word equivalency is in the middle of it. That's because the way that they work, they are taking the quantity of injured resource and they're matching it up against the quantity of restoration needed to offset the injured resources. So uh, again, not calculating dollars, we're calculating how much restoration we need to implement to offset injured natural resources. And that's what we did here. That's what we did for this case. So this is gonna get a little, a little more detailed with regard to the groundwater injury assessment that we ran. This is some actual information that we inserted into the resource equivalency analysis. There's key variables that need to be known and inserted into the equation to make it work effectively. And what 
The first variable that I'll talk about is the duration. How long was the groundwater impacted and how big was it? In this case, we don't have data when they started operations. We don't have groundwater data. We know the way that they operated at the site. We made the aggressive assumption that groundwater was impacted shortly after they started operations. Although we don't have data to support it, we think we are justified in assuming an injury start date of 1955. The longer the duration of the injury, the bigger the injury. So that's an aggressive assumption to assume that it started shortly after operations began. We also continue that, that groundwater injury in the model all the way out to 2045. And that's based on groundwater modeling efforts that have been, been undertaken. The next part of the equation that I want to talk about is the inflation rate. This is a simple concept in that the longer a resource has been injured, the larger the injury. If we have an acre of wetland that's been injured for 50 years, not performing the way that it should if it were healthy, that's a larger injury than an acre of wetland that's been injured for five years. And it works the same way on the restoration side of the equation. When you can do a restoration project this year, that's going to be more beneficial than a restoration project you construct 10 or 15 years down, down the road. It's going to be producing those, those benefits for a longer period of time, and that's valued appropriately and captured with the inflation rate that's in our model. Resource equivalency analysis, again, we're looking at the quantity of injured resource to the quantity of restoration, we need to know the gallons. How many gallons have been impacted by, this, by these discharges at this site? And to get the gallons, we're looking at what is the plume size and the, and the formation, the geologic formation porosity. And in this case, we know that the largest plume size was 522 acres. This plume size changes through time, and the model captures that. And then there's the equivalency. We, we've now quantified with those variable inputs, we've now quantified the gallons of, of groundwater that have been injured, and what do we need to do to provide an equivalent number of gallons of recharge to that aquifer? And in this case, we, we are choosing land preservation. Land preservation in perpetuity allows rainfall to recharge aquifers. And again, we're looking at the geologic formation porosity and annual rainfall that provides that number of gallons. So what did the model tell us? Well, it tells us that we need approximately 1,200 acres of land preserved to, to provide, with the aggressive assumptions that we made, to provide an equivalent offset to the injured gallons at this site. So, we wound up negotiating the preservation of 1,000 acres and nine additional projects for ecological and public use benefit. So this is a map of, of the Sibagaygi site and the areas of, 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 of what our settlement is, is preserving. I'm gonna see if I can use this highlighter. Uh, does this have a laser pointer? Vanna White me. Yes, please. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, we are going to start with the former production area. That is the yellow area in the middle. That is the, the former oper operations area. The public will not be permitted in this area. It is currently a solar field. It's been planted with native pollinator, native plants that, that benefit uh, pollinator species in the state. The next area is the per, are the purple areas where it is strictly forest preservation. Um, and so those areas will be preserved in perpetuity. The public will be allowed on those areas. Uh, and then the last area that I want to focus on is, is the green area. That is the riparian corridor right up against Tom's River. That is exactly where you would want to, uh, well, I'll speak for myself. That's the area that I'd be most interested as somebody that uses and enjoys natural resources. And that's the area where the nine 
conceptual projects are currently proposed. Thank you, Sean. So the, the next slide that we have is, is showing projects that we have uh, just, Sorry. Yep. that's okay. All right. Yeah, I, I didn't know we were showing this, but this is fine. Um, so some of you came up and saw the posters uh, before we got started here today. We've got nine proposed projects in concept. They're going to go in that riparian corridor uh, for Tom's River. You see renderings of before and after. Um, and again, I really want to point out that these are concepts, and I would say that they're draft concepts at this point. And if this goes forward, we want to have future public engagement sessions with the community here and determine how we can take these draft concepts and get them into final form. Um, but these projects are going to work together. They're going to form a habitat mosaic that are going to complement each other with ecological improvement in, in a region that's highly developed. So this is a unique opportunity for the community to get these natural resources back for use and enjoyment. And uh, I think it's a tremendous opportunity for, for the community. So the public comment started, public comment period started December 5th for the proposed settlement. It closes on April 5th. Your voice is important to us. We would like you, to, if you feel like making a comment, we would love to hear from you. We will publicly respond to every comment we get. We will post it on our website, and you will be able to see the comments as well as our responses. So here are the potential next steps. Again, we are in the public comment phase, and we hope to have public information sessions to follow. Uh, where we can sit down with people that are interested and determine how we take these draft concepts, advance them into a final form, and once the concepts are settled on, it's at that point we can start the engineering design, which will allow us to apply for permits needed to construct the projects. Construction of these projects is only going to go forward if this settlement agreement is approved and executed. I have one final thought. I'm excited about this opportunity to safely and permanently restore natural resources to this community that's been so harshly impacted by the Superfund site. And I think we have question and answer periods next. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. Um, so we're going we're gonna to move the podium back, um, and then we're going to have a, have a conversation with you all. We've gotten through the formal aspect of this, and we can kind of, we'll all take a breath and try to answer your questions. We hope that we've given you a lot of information today. My understanding is that uh, Mayor Hill would like to make a statement, so we're going to give him the floor um, while we get ourselves set up. Thank you. <laughs> 